Morning, everybody. It's wonderful to be together uh, this morning and a privilege to continue the series through uh, 1 Corinthians. Uh, just a note on our passage today. Uh, verse 9 to 11, you'll see there that there's a number of controversial, uh, well, controversial to the world uh, statements. And uh, I'm going to gloss over those today. No, I'm only kidding. I'm not going to gloss over them. They do, they do sit between these two sections and have relevance to today and next week. And so I'm going to leave the difficult part for Glenn uh, to preach on next week. Uh, so please do take note of that. Let's pray. <coughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. And we thank you, Lord, that... Even though sometimes your word uh, is very difficult to hear, it is nonetheless your word that transforms us and changes us and brings glory to you. And so we pray, Lord, that this morning that your, that your word would bring glory to you as you transform and change us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, can you imagine the perfect church? Can you imagine the perfect church? A church where everyone is united in Christ and sharing a common vision for God's work, all going in the same direction, united. A place where everyone loves each other. There's never any conflict and there's never any disagreements. No one is ever offended, hurt, or sinned against. A church and a place of perpetual harmony and peace. Can you imagine such place? Now come back to reality. Come back to reality. Uh, the church in Corinth in the first century and the church today has to face the reality that there will be disputes and conflict among God's people. Whenever people gather and engage one another, there's always the potential for disputes. Although disputes in a church are not necessarily a sign of an unhealthy church. It can, in fact, be signs of a growing church, growing pains, as sinners seek to serve one another and love one another. But it's how we deal with disputes and conflicts that is all important in the church. You see, if we deal with it in a Christ-like way, with God's wisdom, it will glorify God and strengthen his people. If not, well, then you know how the story goes. The church in Corinth was making a mess of their Christian community life. Remember last week we heard uh, that Paul rebuked their failure to deal with blatant ungodliness amongst <coughs> God's people. And today we see him sharply rebuke them for their mishandling of disputes amongst his people. You see, they were judging disputes in the wrong way. More accurately, they were taking the wrong route to resolving matters. Instead of coming to God's people to resolve things, they run to the world. Verse 6, brothers in Christ are taking one another to court. Verse 7, they are instituting lawsuits against each other. Now, we're not told what these disputes, disputes were that were being taken to court, except that Paul points out in verse 8 that they cheat and do one another wrong. A commentator seemed to think that these disputes were in the realm of business, driven by greed and swindling, as we see in verse 10. But the principle applies uh, to all disputes in the church. Uh, disputes over family agreements, inheritance claims, marriage issues, church matters. Uh, really anything that could be decided by a law court. And of course the principle applies uh, to difficult relationships and conflict. Now whatever it was, Paul is absolutely horrified that the church would go to the courts. That the church would go to the unrighteous to judge a situation. Now look at chapter 6, verse 1. If any of you has a dispute with one another, do you dare take it before the ungodly for judgment instead of before the Lord's people? See, Paul is clearly unhappy about this. He raises this question in verse 4. Therefore, if you have disputes about such matters, do you ask for a ruling from those whose way of life is scorned in the church? I say this to shame you. 
See, he is flabbergasted that God's people would go to unbelievers, would go to the ungodly to judge matters amongst God's people. That they would go to the ungodly to decide on issues the church should have wisdom on. The irony, of course, here for the Corinthian church is that they prided themselves on superior wisdom and superior spirituality. And yet here they are, showing that they are actually immature. Paul tells us they're not even able to judge trivial things in verse 3. See, Paul is clear. Don't go to unbelievers to judge matters between brothers and sisters in Christ. Don't go to unbelievers. Now, he's not at all saying that criminal matters should be dealt with by the church. Paul in Romans chapter 13 tells us clearly that that is a matter of the state. Criminal matters belong to the state. God has ordained that they should do so. The church should never be found hiding criminal activity. That, in God's eyes, would be abhorrent. But what he is saying is that disputes amongst Christians in this life, as far as possible, must be dealt with in-house. Conflict must be dealt with in-house. Why? Well, because we have the resources to do it. Look how Paul points us to the ability of God's people to judge. He has an argument that goes from the greater to the lesser. Verse 2, you will judge the world. Are you not competent to judge, judge trivial cases? Verse 3, you will judge angels. How much more the things of this life? Now, what exactly us judging the world and angel is, is not clear in this passage, except to say that united with Christ, who is the judge over all, we as Christians will have a role to play in his judgment and rule over this world. But the main point Paul is making here, the pertinent point, is that Christians have the God-given ability to discern, evaluate, and judge disputes among themselves. See, Paul is clearly confident that Christians have the resources to resolve matters amongst them. Remember back to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 15. The person with the Spirit makes judgments about all things. But such a person is not subject to merely human judgments, for who has known the mind of the Lord as to instruct him? But we, we have the mind of Christ. We have the wisdom of God. The Spirit who searches the depth of God's thoughts is in us and amongst us. We have the mind of Christ, which is why he asks in verse 5, Is it possible that there is no one among you who has wisdom to deal with such matters? Is there, is there not even one who has the mind of Christ to judge disputes? See, Paul here is essentially saying, why in the world are you going to the ungodly? You just have to judge by their lives that they do not understand the wisdom of God. Why do you go to the ungodly? They have totally different standards to God. And so why go there? We have the mind of Christ, Paul says. We have the Holy Spirit to help us. We have the Holy Spirit to, to uh, guide us into all wisdom and to give us power to deal with conflicts. You see, the Holy Spirit is not just pointing us to the Scripture. The Holy Spirit is indwelling us as a people to help us in difficult conflicts. Now, I can't tell you how many times uh, I've made my way to a meeting knowing that there's conflict, and all I'm thinking is, oh dear, this, this meeting's going to go pear-shaped. <clears throat> have, you ever, have you ever been into a meeting like that amongst Christians? But you know what happens? You know what happens when we're willing to have hard conversations uh, by the Word and the Spirits of God? God shows up. God shows up. And in wisdom and in unity, we're able to deal with things so that we leave more united than before. You see, friends, God's wisdom and His power is not something just theoretical. It works. It's practical. Where the church deals with disputes amongst God's people, God is there. 
In fact, in Matthew chapter 18, uh, it says, where two or three are gathered, I am among you. That's not necessarily talking about us gathering a church. It's talking about in the midst of conflict, where two or three are gathered, I am there among you. We should deal with disputes in-house because we have the resources to do so. We should also deal with disputes in-house because it will keep us united. Uh, Verse 7 tells us, uh, Paul tells us, the very fact that you have lawsuits among you means that you have been completely defeated. Completely defeated. The moment you go to court, the moment you go to unbelievers for judgment, you're defeated. Uh, Think about it this way. Perhaps uh, there's two Christian businessmen uh, whose business has collapsed. And the one thinks the other one's done it. This one thinks that that guy's done it. They go to court. They have the judge uh, make a judgment. And one of them has to pay a million rand. What do you think is going to happen after that to those two Christians? Do you think they're going to walk out the court and the guy's going to say, thank you so much for suing me. I can't wait to put that money in your account. Is that going to happen? No. Do you think they're going to be at church together on Sunday? No. You're completely defeated. Completely defeated. See, we should deal with disputes in-house because we have the resources and because it's a matter of unity. It's a matter of unity. The unity of God's people and the importance of reconciliation is bigger than our trivial disputes. It's bigger. And we should deal with disputes in-house because if we don't, we will destroy our witness to the world. As you read, you can almost hear the Apostle Paul uh, being concerned about this issue. That when we go to the world, we immediately become hypocrites. I thought you people loved one another and you can't sort out this dispute. To be fair, the world's always looking for a reason to condemn us. But we mustn't give them easy pickings. We must rather rely on the Holy Spirit and the Word of God to resolve things amongst one another. You see, it is possible to deal with disputes in-house because God has given us His Word, He's given us His Spirit, and He's promised to be present with us when we have to go through difficult times together, even when things become complicated. See, there is a right way to do things. In fact, uh, there's a way to extinguish disputes by doing it the right way. And the key to dealing with disputes is firstly understanding that we are family. You see, Paul emphasizes in chapter 6 a number of times, brothers and sisters, brothers taking brothers. Verse 1, you are the saints, God's people, God's family. Early on in 1 Corinthians, he calls us God's temple where God dwells. And by the way, he warns that anyone who destroys God's temple will be judged. We are the family of God. See, the people we have conflict with here are not outsiders or enemies. They're our siblings, family who we are to care for. I do understand that some people come from broken families, and so it's hard to understand this concept. But what we're talking about here is a unique family, a family bought at a price, a family in Christ. And in Christ is an important way for us to express this because it reminds us that Jesus is the reason that we are family. Remember the death he paid for, price he paid for our forgiveness? Remember his resurrection that brings us into the family of God? A family that will never split. A family led by God that will one day live together forever. Uh, One of the staff uh, in our discussion this week um, basically said, (laughs) you know, if we don't deal with our issues here, I can imagine God, in his sense of humor, is going to put the person you don't like in a mansion right next to you in heaven. It's going to be your neighbor. So in heaven, all your neighbors are going to be those that you fail to uh, resolve things with. And you've got eternity 
to deal with it. You see, when we understand that God loves us this much, that he has bought a family for himself and that we belong one to another, then surely we won't turn on each other and devour each other. How can we do so knowing that we will live with each other for eternity? Imagine if we truly grasp that we are family. It's not an organization. Surely then we would stick it out a bit longer, even when things get rough, even when we don't feel loved by the family or appreciated by the family. And sadly, this is not how it always goes in the church, is it? Perhaps it's because we undervalue ourselves as members of God's family. Perhaps it's because we fail to see the people around us as God's family. See, Christian families seek wisdom from God to get through the tough times. And that's what Paul is pointing to us, to us here. We're to be a family seeking God's wisdom for reconciliation and unity. So why is it that when things get tough in relationships, in conflicts in church, why is it that we fail to deal with things the right way? Why is it? Is it because no one amongst us is wise? Is it perhaps because we don't actually trust the wisdom of God? Or is it because we know that if we go to the people of God, we're not going to get the answer we want? That we're actually going to be corrected. And therefore, I'm going to the worldly guys because they're definitely going to have my back. Now, interestingly, in our challenge as church to churches today, it's not so much that we go to the courtroom. It's more that we avoid conflict entirely. When we are hurt, we run away to another church. When we offend others, we push them away. Or, or perhaps, even if we do stay, is it that we run to others in the church not to seek reconciliation, but to get them on our side. To get them to say what we need them to say in order that we can be right. Friends, perhaps we avoid God's way because what we know is that what we may need to do is too difficult and costly. Maybe we avoid God's way because we don't want to be humbled under God's word. See, sometimes love means bearing a cost in order to extinguish a dispute. This is what I think Paul means in verse 7. He says to them, why not be wronged? Why not be cheated? Of course, you could read this as Paul merely using hyperbole to make the point that you must never go to lawsuits. It must never be an option. But actually, I think, and the commentators agree, that Paul is picking up on a gospel principle here. He's picking up the gospel of Christ. You see, forgiveness, reconciliation, and unity is so vitally important that we should be willing to bear the cost. Unfortunately, we are so influenced by this world that this idea is foreign and even offensive to us. That we should bear a cost when somebody else has done something to us. The, the modern world doesn't think like this. And often we don't think like this either. We demand justice the right way. Even in petty and trivial things, we demand our rights over the rights of others. We demand our rights at the expense of others. You see, it's almost as if the church in Corinth and the church today has forgotten what 1 Peter 4 verse 8 says. Above all, love each other deeply. Why? Because love covers over a multitude of sins. How, is, how are sins covered by love? Not by demanding a cost from somebody else, but by bearing the, the, the cost for yourself. 
Remember Jesus' words? Perhaps we've forgotten these. Love your enemies. If he says love your enemies, how much more so your family? Remember what Paul said in chapter 4. When we are cursed, we bless. When we are persecuted, we endure. When we are slandered, we answer kindly. See, the gospel points us away from our rights and willing at all costs to a better way. The gospel points us to a better way of Christ crucified, the way of love. See, that's the principle here. Think about this as God's way for a moment. Think about what God himself did. God, who was rejected and offended by his very creation, could have justly demanded payment right there and then. For humanity to pay the cost of our sin and rebellion and rejection of him. To pay the price for their crime against him. And yet, what did he do? What did Jesus do? Well, innocent, he faced scorn, mocking, abuse, physical and spiritual. He bore the cost for my sin and yours. He suffered death so that the very people who wronged him would be reconciled. See, the love of God bears the cost so that we can be forgiven and reconciled to himself. We deserve death. We deserve to pay the price. God paid it. Jesus, in his humility, humbled himself even unto death to bear the cost for us. If we follow Christ crucified, then we follow his example. David Jackman poses this question. Uh, did that victory at the cross for us come about by the Lord Jesus standing on his rights, safeguarding his interests and insisting upon having his own way? Absolutely not. What does the cross teach but that sacrifice is the road to reconciliation and forgiveness? This is God's way. And are we willing as God's people to take his way in disputes? It's worth pointing out that when we truly grasp the depth of the cost Jesus bore for us, then we will understand how little in comparison we are to bear in our pursuit of reconciliation with others. When we understand the depth of what Jesus did for us on the cross. And friends, the disputes that we have in this life will seem trivial. Don't mishear me. I'm not saying they're trivial. And I'm not saying this is easy at all. This is costly. But when we understand the depth of forgiveness that we have been given, then we understand what it takes in the messiness of life. See, our unwillingness to forgive our brother or sister in Christ and our unwillingness to bear a cost to do so might just mean it's a reflection on our spiritual maturity. Remember what the apostle is doing to the, for the 1 Corinthians here? Chapter 14, verse 20. Brothers and sisters, stop thinking like children or stop thinking like the world in regard to evil be infants, but in your thinking be adults. Remember Jesus' words, those who are forgiven much, love much. Those who are forgiven much, forgive much. Jesus even taught us to pray this way, didn't he? Father, forgive us our debts as we forgive others. Friends, are we willing to bear a cost for the sake of reconciliation and unity? Are we willing to let love cover over a multitude of sin? Are we willing to forgive when we are slandered? Are we willing to let go of bitterness? Perhaps are we even willing to cancel a debt, a financial debt, in order to bring peace amongst God's people? Are we willing to bear a cost to keep our marriages together? 
Friends, I can't tell you how many times I've sat with a couple in my office and they say, Graham, we're getting a divorce. Defeated. Defeated. Couldn't the wisdom and power of God two years ago have dealt with this issue? Couldn't you have come to God in humility? Couldn't you bear the cost of the difficulties of your marriage? See, friends, if we are willing, if we are willing to deal with our conflicts, it's messy. If we're willing to deal with them on both sides, if people are willing to humble themselves and repent of their sin and their offense, if we're willing to take the burden and the cost of the messiness of those relationships, then we can be united. You see, extinguishing disputes takes humility from us. It takes the wisdom and power of God. It's hard work, and it costs, but it's worth it. It's worth it. Our final point this morning comes from verse 9 to 11, and it puts disputes in perspective. He wants to put disputes in perspective, firstly by giving us a warning and then a wonderful reminder and encouragement. Look at the warning from verse 7. Why not rather be wronged? Why not rather be cheated? Instead, you yourselves cheat and do wrong, and you do this to your brothers and sisters. Well, do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor uh, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, drunkards, slanderers, or swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Do not be deceived. You who do such things will not receive the kingdom of heaven. See, if we are unwilling to reconcile and unwilling to forgive, if we are unwilling to acknowledge and repent of our sin, then we are in danger. Why? Because an unwillingness to do so may be a reflection of your spiritual state. Unwillingness to acknowledge our sin and the effects on other people might mean that we don't truly understand forgiveness. That we don't understand the depth of our sin and the payment that Jesus had to pay for us. Perhaps our unwillingness to sacrifice and bear a cross, to actually forgive people and not hold on to things, maybe that is revealing a heart of pride. Where you want justice my way. And only when I get that, then I will forgive you. That's not the way of Christ crucified. See, this warning is not just encouraging us to resolve our disputes. It's also a warning that if we continue in our sin, we can have no assurance of salvation. Friends, the warning is clear. Deal with disputes amongst God's people. Do so in humility. Do so willingly and to bear a cost so that there will be unity so that there will be love. The warning is clear. And so is the wonderful reminder. Look at verse 11. Uh, Paul's done this already in, in the previous chapter. And that is what some of you were. Friends, don't be like that. Don't be divided and have silly, controversial, trivial issues uh, dividing the people of God. That's what the world does. That's not who you are now. You were washed. You were washed. The stain of sin has been washed away. You have been sanctified. You've been made holy and separated by God to be his holy people. We've been justified. We've been declared right before God. Our sin, past, present, and future is not counted against us. And therefore, we can live out the true gospel, Christ crucified, lovingly reconciling when disputes come our way. See, unresolved disputes, disputes taken to the ungodly, unforgiveness, bitterness, divisions, disunity, that's all the old man. We are a new creation. 
by the grace of God and by the power of God. See, what God has done for us in our salvation, the completed work of Christ, is the same thing that he can do amongst us by his power and his grace. If we seek to solve disputes God's way, he will honor that. And so, friends, when we get into disputes and conflicts as the church of God, will we seek to humble ourselves? Will we seek to come to God's wise people to find counsel, to pray, and to find a way to reflect the gospel of Christ crucified? You now know why the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 13 comes to that glorious chapter on love. Listen to these words in closing. Imagine if we are these, this people. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast, and it is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It's not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that this word spoken to my own heart and spoken to the hearts of this congregation, your people, our family, uh, will do the work that you have set it out to do. And so we pray, Lord, that by your power, by your word, by your spirit, that you would help us. That, Lord, if we are convicted by this word, that we will not run away, but that we would run to our brothers and sisters, that we would seek to reconcile, seek to be united, not in our power or based on our judgments, but on the wisdom of God and the power of God. Oh, Lord, help us. We need you. In Jesus' name. Amen.